Welcome to Champagne Chats, discussions in the green room where we talk all things about the events industry. I'm Kate Woolley, also known as DJ Wildflower, and it's great to be joining you today. Coming up, we have the fabulous Carmen Braidwood joining me as we kick off season two of the podcast. Let's get started. Today on the show, I am so excited to have a very special guest joining me. She is a local personality, a modern media coach, radio and TV personality, and MC in demand all across Australia. She's usually the one leading the interview, but today she has kindly given me the opportunity to have her here as my guest today. Thank you so much for joining me, Carmen. Yay, Kay! <laughs> Yay. I'm so pleased to be the start of season two. Oh, that makes me very happy as well. It's really a true honour because, look, this is a full circle moment. As one of your students <laughs> at your Confidence on Camera coach, that is my a, a course, mm-hmm. um, I could not have even imagined being at this point, but that was really part of the idea of when I approached you. I had wanted to start doing these sorts of things. There was a lot of resistance. Getting in my own way was one of them. And so I signed up with you and uh, the rest is history um, because I was able to learn so much from you. So thank you so much for being part of the very early stages of the journey. I'm really delighted. <laughs> uh, my pleasure. I'm so pleased that it's walking through your your journey, if you like, to, to continue that analogy. Yes. And it's it's playing out in this way where you've got this gorgeous set, just Thank you quietly. So much. Uh, husband behind the scenes doing all the other stuff. Doing everything. <laughs> wow. This is honestly the podcasting environment that I dream of oh, as a wow. podcaster. I'm so blown away. Oh, Carmen, thank you so much. That really means a lot. Because as you know, a lot of work really does go into this. I would just love to have a studio that just click your fingers and it exists <laughs> and it doesn't and there's quite a lot that goes in the setting up there's cords there's cameras there's cables there's all sorts of things but ultimately it's the for me it was all about what is the idea I wanted to do a podcast I think a lot of people go oh, I'd love the idea of doing a podcast yeah but I wanted to have a topic that would resonate with an audience mm-hmm. because for me, it's not just about doing something what how can I actually provide something that gives benefit to the, the listener yeah the value that you're going to bring the right? value. that was really what was behind confidence on camera as Mm. a program. Before that, it was kind of a terrible conceptual idea of media skills Mm. for for businesses. And really what it was about was the value that I as a broadcaster, TV and radio presenter and producer and programmer uh, can bring to your content, right? There are so many ways that we can make content. And in reality, it's very easy. If you want it to be, you can just riff for half an hour and stick it on the internet and that's a podcast. But there are cool things yes. that broadcasting, TV and radio have has learned over the years and shown us how to do mm. to make that content more entertaining. Yes. And it's really nice to see you yeah, bringing those things into play. And, yeah, I think we can all level things up so that, like you say, your audience is front and centre because at the end of the day, without an audience, you're nowhere. And <laughs> well, this is the number one golden rule of a performer. If yeah. you don't have an audience, there's no one there to entertain and you don't have a job, you don't have a reason to go on. And you're talking into a vacuum <laughs> or an echo chamber and all your ideas are awesome because there's no conversation. Exactly. No one's coming back to you with any kind of feedback. And at the end of the day, if you're in business, you want to start having conversations yes. with people. So make content that gets them listening and gets them wanting to engage with you. Exactly. So even as I was making that introduction, I faffed my words. One of my favorite takeaways for your course was lose that connection to perfection. Because when I would fuck up, I would like go into a meltdown. Mm. I made a mistake. It's okay. We all make mistakes. And I think those sorts of mental hurdles that you help me go through, even as I speak to you now as someone that I find, um, you know, I'm very enamored with your your career. We'll, we'll circle back to that in a moment. Um, it still has provided me skill sets to be sort of confident in myself and enough to try something, knowing that it's not perfect because no one's perfect, but just to give it a go. So on that note, I would just love to know, well, actually, before we go into your mm-hmm. career, I'm going to talk about firstly how we met. Okay, please do. <laughs> I'd love to hear that. Do you remember the event? We actually met at an event. Yeah, well, I think the anniversary is around now, isn't it? It was. So yeah. it was, mo- actually, is next week. Yeah. Oh, happy. 
cheers oh, happy, cheers, anniversary. happy anniversary okay <laughs> this is really <laughs> wow even more of a full circle <laughs> moment well this is probably going to be dated now but we met in 2020 for a Melbourne Cup event and you were emceeing and I was just so impressed with your management of the room you had an incredible stage presence um, I loved your speaking voice you were witty and funny I had recently moved to Perth it was one of the first events that I was doing post-COVID uh, during COVID rather so my knowledge of you was as an MC host and yeah. then subsequently found out that you had had a long, illustrious career in radio and television. You've worked in all sorts of things. But the reality is the timing that I met you, you had gone through a rather large change in your career. So can you give me a bit of a background as to where you were in 2020 and where you had gone um, up to that point? Okay. All right. So 2020, as we all know, was the big year where everything changed. But really for me, the big year where everything changed happened a couple of years before that. So in 2018, overnight, uh, the big boss of the radio station I worked for here in Perth flew in from Sydney, sat my co-host and I down, and after seven years presenting the same radio show in Perth for me, for my co-host, I think like 20 years, he'd wow. been in the same job, uh, he said, listen, guys, that's your last show. Thanks very much. And yeah, no. I more. didn't even know that it happened <laughs> after that. It wasn't even like, here's your notice. No. Well, if they said if you want, you can do a show tomorrow and say goodbye. But we, if you want, <laughs> yeah. Oh, what a, yeah. <laughs> oh, not feeling the vibes yes. <laughs> right now. But yeah, that was pretty big in terms of the impact it had on my lifestyle because that really was for me 17 years of full time breakfast radio, even though it was seven years at that station. Before that, I worked on the East Coast, in country Victoria and in Queensland. And I was always doing on air or producing breakfast radio. So whether it was producing or reading news or doing a show, that was my life. So that meant those really weird hours. Can you tell me about the hours? So mm. How early would you have to get up to work on breakfast radio or produce be breakfast radio? Yeah, look, it depends on the role, but, you know, you're in no later than 4.30am oh. unless you're being late for everything at about 4.45. Yeah, I've got to be fully honest. Uh, but yeah, back in the news reading days, you know, I was in there at about half past three. So you, it's quite antisocial, the lifestyle that you need to lead. And, yes. you know, overnight, uh, I got to know my husband and my stepson a whole lot better because suddenly I'm waking up and watching their morning routine that I'd never been a part of, you know. Wow. But for me, even though it was such a dramatic change in the way I worked, I was pretty excited by the opportunity. I I will admit that I've always been a kind of person who goes, something cool's going to come out of this. Mm. You know, it's freeing me up for something else. In the media, you're a bit of a jack of all trades. I was already doing some casual TV presenting and I knew that I wanted to do more of that. I still really want to host like live TV. I'd love to do that one day. Anyone watching? Coming out uh, to the universe. Yeah, just put it out there. <laughs> so, yeah, like the, I thought to myself, yeah, this is great. Something cool or different is going to happen. But what I didn't account for happening was 2020, right, and by then I was doing some freelance work at 6PR and by the time I'd met you, I had to be phoning in to 6PR because I live with three chronic illnesses mm -hmm. so I didn't know if I could go to the radio station. 6PR, if you're listening nationally, is the local talkback radio station. So I'd switched formats, learnt to do talkback but also I'd gotten this cool chance as a result of being at home all the time. Mm. I couldn't go and do the casual TV work that I was doing and I couldn't do the in-person workshops I'd started doing. And that was a an idea I had because my husband is a chiropractor and mm. back when we met, I taught him to speak on camera to make videos to promote his small business. That's right. I've seen his videos. Yeah. really well. <laughs> they do really well. You know, they still bring people all over Perth into his clinics and now he's got a new product, the Posture Park, which is being promoted with video in the same way and I bump into people who've seen him in their feed. And yeah. So I, I knew that this could help small businesses. I just didn't know how to market it. Mm. You know, I was I was doing these in-person workshops and come the pandemics, a coach I worked with said to me, you could build a whole online program out of this. Right. And by the time I met you, that Melbourne Cup, yeah, MC work had become kind of this, oh, look, if I have to do it to help out a friend like I was doing that day, yeah. um, I will, or I'll only work for really big corporates who can really afford a great MC for a couple of days. Yeah. You know, so I wasn't doing as much of that. I was really relying on this amazing network of small business owners right across Australia, New Zealand, who had booked me as either a one-on-one -on -one or into a group program mm. to learn how to speak on camera. And obviously the pandemic taught people 
why they need to speak on camera. We had professional speakers who lost their entire career if they couldn't figure out Mm. how to do what they did virtually. DJs who, if they weren't as smart as you, to build a set in their living room and run a live stream, who lost their career, And not even as smart, out of necessity. I think that that point of of where you came in, um, we were talking off camera about some of the people that you work with where they've had no need to do something on camera and you come in at that time where they need to do something. needs to be professional to that level. It's not something that they can just do on their phone and they need a professional recording of the audio and the video and all those things. Yeah. Um, so it really was an interesting intersection because coming in from Perth, from Sydney, mm. into the event space thinking, gosh, I really hope I can keep working at events. But I had been wor- working virtually with an um, uh, East Coast client. Yeah, so you had that little edge. So I was still working in the, re- in the virtual space yeah. across that time. So the rest of the world, unlike Perth, where we're a little bubble here, mm-hmm. we were able to work with our virtual clients and then, but still do live events. So we, it was quite unique in that space. So very, very lucky for that. Yeah. And there were some people who were lucky, right? They had a little bit of extra skill set, I mm-hmm. guess, that they could adopt and employ. But there were other people who needed a bit of extra support. And I was really surprised how my broadcasting background could help me. Because as a, in radio and TV, you just need to be very agile things will happen. Your boss will fly in one day and tell you you're sacked. It's actually quite normal to lose your job in radio and TV overnight. I feel like yeah. that's a, it's a, I've heard that story many times over from different broadcasters yeah. who've worked to that. It seems cr- pretty brutal, but I mean, that was your last job in radio for seven years you mentioned. Mm. Before that, can you give me a little bit of a rundown about your radio career? It wasn't, this was in Perth, your most recent job that you were working at. Tell me whereabouts exactly you have worked. Because I know that you started in Perth, left and then come back yeah. again. Yeah. So she Shout out to all the people in Mandra. That's where I used to go do afternoon shifts when I was uh, still at uni. Yes. And then I went to Kalgoorlie and worked at 6KG hosting the afternoon show and also making a whole lot of ads. Shout out Kalgoorlie. I've been there a few times this year. Yeah, Kalgoorlie like, Race Round. Yes, on the mini that? beers. <laughs> <laughs> they know how to do events, they do. right? I went to the, the races in Kalgoorlie and I did not see a single horse. I had so much fun. They have horses there? <laughs> That's what I said on the radio on the Monday. So that was my first full-time break, uh, radio job. I was hosting afternoons, doing yeah. the ads, and then I would fill in on breakfast. Mm. That filling in on breakfast was the thing that caught the ear of my program director who used to work over on the East Coast in a country radio network called the ACE Radio Network. So if you're listening in Victoria, you might know Colac, Warnable, Horsham, Swan Hill, Terralgan. I did a radio show that broadcast to all of those country Goodness. towns. Uh, starting off in Colac and then I worked my way through a lot of those country towns. Yeah. It was a great place to live. I came back to Perth for a little interlude and produced breakfast at Perth's 92.9, which Mm -hmm. back then was a female skewed station, not the triple M that you might know it as today. Yes. Uh, Produced, and then I started doing some news reading for them along with Mix 94.5, just upstairs in the same network. And then I went over to Queensland and the Gold Coast um, all this, every time packing up my whole possessions into my Hyundai accent and driving it or sticking it on a truck and, yeah, went up to the Gold Coast. And honestly, I was so freaking happy reading news on CFM on the Gold Coast. I would get to work at that terrible time, like half past three, but I'd be out the door at about 9.15. Wow. All morning I'd be reading the news, watching the sun come up. Uh, well, not o- yeah, over the ocean, yeah, over there. So watching the, the sun sunrise. come up over the ocean, it was gorgeous, uh, you know, and I could then go to the beach at nine or maybe go to yoga. It's a real lifestyle job over there. Mate, it was. Yeah. And I the do love the news Gold Coast. was good. Gold Coast was so fun. I, and I lived in Surfers Paradise, which suited me back then. I was 28, 29. Yeah. Now I'd, I'd be much more of a burly heads kind of a girl. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Fantastic. And then I got the job, my program director in, it's always talking to someone, you know, my program director in Gold Coast was ex-Perth, ex-specifically 96FM, and one day in the hallways he's like, I can get you back to Perth. And I'm like, I'm not leaving Gold Coast. <laughs> I don't want to leave Perth. <laughs> I'm in this town. I look fabulous. That's I think right. I was loving it. But, yeah, I was you know, in, in radio terms, if you're a person who's worked in the media, you'll know that, you know, doing breakfast radio in your home city, it was a news reading plus on the show kind of a job and I don't know if you can hear that from what you're hearing right now but I don't make necessarily a great news reader because I'm pretty out there and I love to have a conversation I've got a few opinions and in news we're supposed to be somewhat neutral and um, it always happened that I'd be doing the news and then I'd get dragged into the show or I'd fill in on the show right 
Yeah, so, so I you um, really were more yeah. of an editorial kind of yeah. journalist. <laughs> You've got an opinion and you want to share it, and that's great yeah. because I th- I love speaking to you. You're always just such a bright, bubbly force. I can't imagine keeping to the facts with the news no, being one hundred percent of the journey. No, exactly. uh, when Comment. you went, you said you started working in Mandurah radio station off the back of uni. Mm. Did you study radio? At university? No. So did you study? I did uh, an arts degree at UWA and I did not study journalism. This no. big revelation, I'm not a journalist by trade, if you like. Right. I learned on the job. So I came out of my degree at UWA. And in fact, I was halfway through it and I was really bored. And I heard an ad on the radio one day for radio school. So I went, uh, auditioned and got into the Academy of Radio. I did this six-month course, extremely industry-focused. Mm. You got to meet all these great broadcasters. And I just got a taste of what I liked, which was news. Even back then, everyone was going, oh, you definitely make a better show person. You're great on air. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, but I just want to be, I wanted to be like Lois Lane. Yes. Yeah. I had this little fantasy in my head that I'd marry Clark Kent and, yeah, it was just on loop. I soon figured out you can't run from the real you and, yeah, yeah. I was doing breakfast shows pretty much immediately. The minute I, yeah, got out of that first job in Kalgoorlie, it was all breakfast radio. And Brilliant. On air or producing it and it wasn't until I went to the Gold Coast that I kind of muscled my way back yes. into news and, yeah, even there I was filling into the breakfast show within a couple of months. Yes. How would socialising for evening events work in breakfast radio? Because mm-hmm. I do see a lot of radio ho- hosts out at events yeah. and I think how can you manage your timetable Going out for a nighttime event when you have to get up and be at work at four o'clock in the morning. Delusion, Kate. Lots of delusion. Delusion. Yeah. (laughs) I had myself convinced that I was better on low sleep. Yeah. I used to say this to my co-hosts often and they'd be like, no, no, you're not. (laughs) But I would go out anyway because it's part of the gig. It's absolutely part it's of part the part of the job. So yeah. you've got your morning hours, but there mm. is an expectation that you're out there to socialise because that's part of when you've got sponsors on the radio, you've got people that you're invited to events. It's nice getting invited to the events. Yeah, that's and you've I... got to live like a Perth person, right? Mm. So if there's something happening in that city, you've got to be there and experience it so you can talk about it. There's that argument or see that movie. Uh, in saying that, though, if I was doing it now, you know, I'm in my 40s now, I don't think I would be able to maintain the pace that I kept up while I was broadcasting full time. I I didn't say no to much. I took MC work most weekends and I was made to feel as well. There was this kind of understanding that it's you you do more. You like you should be seen at things. You should write the opinion piece for the paper. You should Goodness. do this PR interview. You should take that MC gig because it's all exposure mm. for the radio station. You know, half the time I wasn't being paid to be out in the evenings or out on weekends at events. It was it was just to ex- just yeah, part of the role. Be part of Perth and be seen. Yeah. Uh, I did I did feel like there were colleagues that I worked with who were like much more uh protective of their boundaries they've been in it longer than I had or maybe they had small kids and they said no I don't do that which actually only increased the pressure on me to to pull the weight of the whole team exactly because you're the one picking up the time and you're the one that's going to be there yeah working in the radio industry you you, were at university Mm. you've done a radio course yes did you continue your degree as well at the same time so you did your degree you did a radio course off the back of that you have had a a large career in radio which has then had an offshoot into lots of different areas yeah at any point while you're working in radio before the decision was made for you that you were no longer going to work on that specific radio show did you have ideas about where you thought you might be heading with this career or specifically what you wanted to do with this yeah I think I definitely had this long-term interest in in doing TV. You know, that was something to me that was was the next stage. See, for me, radio and speaking, it didn't come naturally. It didn't come easily. I was really into theatre and things like that, right, but I had to really work at it. I mm. wasn't the one who was obviously talented. I, I, in fact, was the one who was told often, oh, perhaps you better look for another pursuit. It's not really – you're not really – Good enough, you know, and yep. it felt really good to prove to myself that I could practice something and get quite good at it. And that was really what I had to do with radio. So I kind of thought, look, TV would be the next thing. Mm. Learning to be able to cope when someone sticks a camera in your face 
which we now all know will just rob you of all capacity to speak or charisma or exactly. anything you've learned in the past. We can have Gone. a conversation. You stick a camera in someone's face. <laughs> Freak that fuck out. It's a lot. Yeah. Uh, which brings us into your, your, your next part of your career where you're actually now teaching people mm. this confidence on camera skills. You're taking all of this, you're wanting to work in television. You do work in television. I love watching your segments on Destination WA. Where, at what point did you start pulling together your confidence on camera course, which is what ultimately was what I joined um, mm. two years ago? So I did have a little tiny idea that this is where it might go. And the one person who made me realise that I could go out there and create a business on my own was definitely my husband. Uh, Ryan has run businesses, you know, since he graduated Mm. university as a chiropractor. You might not realise this, but, you know, most healthcare professionals, particularly in allied health, need to be good business operators. Mm. Otherwise, they're they're not going to work. They're sole traders. They're sole traders, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. And the ones who who don't want to do that need to go and get a job with someone else and there's only ever so Mm. far they can go. Mm. So he just, uh, through our conversations, we just learned, I learned a lot about Mm. what it takes, I guess, to start a business and it started to feel a little more achievable. And I knew that I'd added value to him as a business owner by teaching this skill. The thing that definitely held me back was this classic case of imposter syndrome. I've just told you for the last almost half an hour, you know, all I've done is radio, 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 yeah. radio. I love radio. Great. I love, I believe I'm great at radio. I still love radio. You are. And I I liked TV and I got great opportunities through TV, but I still kind of considered myself a novice mm. in TV. In reality, looking back, I've been doing stuff around TV adjacent to my tele- radio career. Like it, it's been going on for the same amount of time, right? It has. I know that because I've, I, I do my research. You One of the up. first things you told us was to do your research. So I mm. watched your sizzle reel. I've done a little dig through YouTube and you've really been doing, mm. you actually have quite a broad career in um, various segments in corporate and, and, and television, presenting, being interviewed. Even now I see quite often you're being brought as a TV cross mm. as the Perth, you know, when they have the oh, TV yeah. squares. News commentary. News now. commentary. I was like, I don't yeah. know what the word is when you have like the, the person from each state that's being asked to comment on, yeah. uh, on a situation. And I find your commentary very insightful, which speaks to not being a newsreader type. Yeah. You're someone with a with um an opinion. And that's what I've come to realise, Kate, and I, I now celebrate that. That's my uniqueness. That's mm. my unique selling proposition, if you like. You know, compared to a lot of news readers or journalists who do media training out there, they they are sometimes people who've only ever been a reporter in a newsroom, which, don't get me wrong, is extremely gruelling. You need Mm. to have so many very finely tuned skills that when I got the opportunity to go and learn those skills, I decided to tap out. I was Mm. um, getting work experience in a local newsroom uh, in TV. I'd been working in radio newsrooms. I was really excited about the idea of doing that. Um, but the fact is, by then I was 30, I'd met my husband, I had my stepson in my life, and I was hoping to have a family as well, uh, grow my family. And I, I just realised I didn't want to spend my Saturdays working for free to go into a job that wouldn't even pay as much as the one I already had, mm. which is a pretty good career as a breakfast radio host. Yes. So I decided to leave that alone, right? But but what I've realised since is that when you do live breakfast radio or you do live TV, yeah, there, there's a, there's this awesome ability to converse, to be natural, mm. to be dynamic on a camera that sometimes journalists miss out on growing that skill, yep. uh, particularly in a reporting job. Mm. And I knew that that was what I could bring mm. as a confidence on camera coach. Mm. Soon. It took me a while to figure that out, but I got there. It is a, so your role, as you describe it, is a modern media coach. Mm. So confidence on camera is not about teaching someone to be a TV presenter no. to go there and, and read on Channel Nine no. as the news director. You're talking in the modern media space, which is what so uh, mobile phones, laptops, any sort of format. So how do you describe the modern media? Yeah. Coach. The modern media is the entire media landscape as we have it in front of us right now in 2023. That includes legacy or traditional media. So that's your TV and your radio opportunities. But they're the opportunities that are extended, if you like, to the real people in this Mm. world, not necessarily the people who are doing the news. And then the, the digital streams. So social media, 
every single one of those platforms and being ready to embrace a new one when it drops and it will, <laughs> there'll be something new. And also all of the other digital platforms uh, that aren't social media, the things like you're doing right now, hosting your own podcast. We've all got this opportunity to, to share our story, to educate our audience. There's a revenue opportunity as business owners to explain to the market what we do, to explain the differentiation. I'm not training young TV presenters mm -hmm. here. You can go to the Academy of Performing Arts at, or no, now you can go to ECU Broadcasting or to NIDA or you can go to Murdoch to their amazing program or to Curtin. There's many places you can learn mm -hmm. to be a TV or a radio presenter. I'm helping you be the one that the media goes to when they need an expert DJ to talk about the events industry and the impact that the last few years has had on you, right? Mm. That's what we go to Kate for. Uh, and also we're creating a, a bank of content in your toolkit mm. that your clients can use to go, oh, this bird can string a few words together. She can MC as well as DJ the yep. event, right? Yep. It's, it's education for your audience who are your clients. It is. And the expectation that all of us now through the end, it's, it's, you get sick of talking about the COVID experience, but the reality is we all had to sit there on our computers, face a screen and learn how to communicate. Be aware of lighting, be aware of how your sound mm. travels in an echoey room and making sure you've got various things that make your, your space soundproofed. Yeah. Things that we never even considered before and now just part of everyday acceptance. I think a lot of people have like a ring light as part of their yeah. at-home kit <laughs> and uh, an understanding that audio is actually really important when you talking to someone. Yeah. Audio makes all the difference. It does make all the difference. It's actually really interesting because this, the, the champagne chats, conversations in the green room is really about capturing conversations like this that we have interesting conversations on so many different topics. I'm talking about the events industry because that's my job. Mm. I, I work in events, but it could literally be talking to anyone in any format. It's really conversations with people and kind of capturing people's experience. And ultimately, this is why this sort of format exists. And mm. for in two ways, you can watch this as a, a video and you can listen to this as a podcast and people receive the information that they, in the way that they like to. Yeah. And I think that's a real interesting thing. It's not just about what you want to give someone, how does someone want to listen? Yeah. What is the best way for them to take in the information? How do they enjoy it? A lot of people who, um, for instance, watching podcasts might be happy just watching the little short snippets and they've got what they need. Other people invest in the whole thing. And that's kind of the the symptoms of, of how we all enjoy content. It's, yeah. it's really understanding what people are wanting and what you're wanting to provide and trying to find something in, in the middle. Yeah. And what's really cool about this time is that finally it's not the broadcast media or the big media companies that are leading the way. They are following, right? It's It's been digital media that has said, ha, ah, ah, this is how we're going to consume. Yeah. And the big traditional broadcasters, the big, big media companies who own all the different platforms now, they've gone, oh, hang on, we need online uh, digital, what are we looking for? Digital publications, yeah. right? We've got to buy newspapers now. We've got to buy a radio network. We've got to buy a TV network. And then we're going to have this whole other thing that is digital broadcasting. So podcasting is coming in. And as recently as 10 years ago, I said to my program director, do you reckon we should podcast the show? It seems like it's a big thing. And they said, yeah. no, not yet. It's not big enough for us to invest in. Now they're across it, yeah. right? Yeah. So it, it happens. So it was 10 years ago you were having oh. these conversations about that because realising that some people were wanting to go back and listen to broadcasts again and yeah. maybe there was something an uh, interview that they didn't get a chance to hear. And now we're just so used to everything on demand. Yeah. You barely even have to worry. I mean, we would sit there if it was, say, for instance, something on TV yeah. and it was a finale and if you missed, missed it, it, you would never see it again. And <laughs> there was a power outage. Like that was it. Like if, if, if the night that Molly died on country practice, there was a power outage, like millions of people would not have seen it. Oh, you know, that no. would be it. That would be just over. And I'm sorry about the reference. Some people will not remember. No. But, you know, like these are the things that kind of shaped us. But now those yes. things that shape a culture are happening in a place that used to be the home of subculture. But the argument is that we can still get a monoculture moment, right? The monoculture moment 
is coming through when things actually transcend just one platform. Yeah. You know, look at Barbie. She just infiltrated all the platforms for most of 2023 yeah. and it meant that we were all listening at the same time. Oh, that was a masterclass in marketing. Yeah. I still haven't watched it. Oh, you're kidding. <laughs> but you've probably got the gist because I've it's been everywhere. Gist. I feel like I've seen it. I'm not a big movie buff in terms of how I like to watch content. Yeah. I like to wait till it's on TV and then fall asleep and then watch it again yeah. when I've... <laughs> It's all about that. <laughs> it's available for streaming. You can check it out. <laughs> <laughs> the reason why I talked about like um, the champagne chats and how this is all set up is because mm. the questions I've been asking a lot of um, my guests so far are very specific to performers who are working yeah. in the events industry. You work in the events industry because you host and, and we go out to events, but you, you, I wouldn't say you are necessarily an event person. You're a media person. So yeah. it's, a, it's a slightly different landscape. I guess so. But at the same time, I feel like it's very overlapped and integrated. They're crisscrossy because, you know, during uni, while I was doing the radio school thing, I paid for my radio school by going and doing some pro-am acting work, right? So my best acting job was hosting the Constable Care puppet shows around WA, so teaching kids how to cross the road and stuff and not to take drugs and use protective behaviours, which then led to a murder mystery and time travel hosting job, party job. So I used to host these Oh, I need to see some footage of this. Oh, there's probably costume. I had a great costume wardrobe, right? So I would host murder mystery parties. So I've been emceeing or hosting live events even longer than I've been broadcasting. This is not a new thing for you. This is always, there were always signs that you were going to be heading into that direction. Yeah. And and if anything like that, I do still emcee things occasionally uh, for the right (laughs) environment, for the right price (laughs) and the things that I'm passionate about. Uh, But realistically, yeah, that's the thing I've been doing the longest. Yeah. That, That is the thing that maybe some of the kind of tiredness is kicking in and I'm like, oh, I I just, I watch you online and I'm like, oh, how does she have the energy to stay standing in those heels? It's a facade. You give the energy. It's it's part of that performance, isn't it, with what you're doing there. And one of the really delightful things about doing these podcasts is the interviews with people who have really incredible insights. And one of the insights from one of the past uh, guests was Renee Wingfield. Yeah. And I I actually re-listened to the podcast ahead of sort of preparing for today. And she just gave away this little beautiful nugget. And she said that in terms of being an artist, it's okay to let go, not take on those events, those that don't serve you anymore. Yeah. So there, there might be those legacy, legacy jobs that you've got clients that you would love to have you back or that you've done it before and you feel like you should do. It's okay to let those go. In her specific example, she was talking about other performers coming up underneath and allowing opportunity for that and leaving herself space and scope for that. And I also feel the same, like there's, oh, let the kids do the clubs days. I don't really work past midnight. That's why I love my corporate work. I don't do the club jobs um, (laughs) as much. I don't work in nightclubs anymore. Um, Not that I really did, but it's just not really an area that I'm kind of interested in. Leave that to the kids. I love that. Yeah, but I think it's Mm -hmm. more about allowing space for your own personal growth as opposed to we're, we're too old for it, I think, well, that's the yeah, point. And that is probably the first that thing that growth. kicks in. So this, it's not an ages thing. Yeah. It's a growth thing. Oh, thank you for that. And this I is feel making like, me feel better. No, I really do because yeah. I feel like it's okay to say that we've done something for a while mm. and I've got certain jobs that I've done every year for the last four years and I hope they book me back next year because I just love it and I'll do yeah. it every year until they have me. Other ones – it's done its dash and it's time to let it go. The moment has passed and there was definitely, you know, I can think of one I did seven in a row, uh, Perth firefighter calendar launches, you know, and that really embodied Carmen of her 30s, (laughs) (laughs) running around in heels. Is there a space for a new host? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Hands up, says says Kate. And this is it, you know, like I just... (laughs) just, I'll, I'll give me a name. <laughs> just, just put my details there. <laughs> and, I, and it's funny, I still bump into people who go, oh, we saw you at the firefighter calendar launch. I'm like, wow, that was back when I could scream over a crowd. Because honestly, the women in the audience at a firefighter calendar launch. <laughs> are I just next... the words, firefighter calendar launch. They're, oh, what a glorious sentence. <laughs> there was one year where we did it in the middle of the city in um, Forest Chase, Forest Place, Chases the shopping centre, place is the place. Anyway, we're in the middle of Forest Place and they put on, you know, the water labyrinth or the water oh, yeah. features yeah, yeah. in the middle of the performance. Like the firefighters oh, were the on stage. Oh, the ground. Yeah, they were oh. on stage and they put that. That was intentional. That was like a thing and there was just like girls gone wild in the audience and, 
it was just wild. It was like nightclub hosting days, you know, and I did, yeah, I'd done my fair share of that and there came a time where I just said, look, I know it's for the kids, PCH are wonderful beneficiaries of um, of this wonderful, wonderful calendar that the guys and girls yeah. get down to next to no clothing for, but Kami's tired. Kami's tired. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just love the boys, love the girls. You guys do a great job, but let's pass the baton. You do sometimes get to go, this has been wonderful innings and I yeah. see you never. <laughs> see you never. It's time for me to do conferences. And you know what? Emceeing conferences was my lifeline when I first finished that job at 96 FM. There was an amazing speaking uh, bureau run by Sheree Gardner, who we only lost this year. Sheree Gardner saved my bacon. She paid for my house for Mm. the first uh, couple of years. Uh, The the corporate MC work and, you know, watching all of those, the speakers at conferences got me all excited about business and, and, and growth and learning new things. And I started to go, I could do this. Yep. I could support people on their journey or I could run a business and I yeah, the things I learned emceeing as a corporate arrangement, God, I'm so grateful for. Isn't it brilliant when you get to go to those events? I've been to many, many, many conferences where I'm booked to either DJ before, during or after, sometimes all three. Yeah. And more often than not, I'll kind of sit there and yeah. listen and they'll have incredible speakers. They'll invite people from all around the world. Yeah. A keynote may not necessarily be specifically about that business. It's all about that big inspiration. Mm. I remember just walking away from like an IT conference, just being so inspired, so motivated. I just, I actually really love that because I would never have had the opportunity to be exposed to someone like yeah. that. And that's all part of, I think the the nice thing that I love about being part of corporate events is generally the ones that have money to do things properly and you yeah. get to have those experiences that you wouldn't necessarily have had they not had the budget. And that's quite a frustration I recall from my cor- my corporate life. Like mm-hmm. when I worked in a full-time job in these big media companies, they never really sent us underlings to those yeah. things. Yes. You know, I only saw the, those. The management, yes. Yeah, the management went. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I don't have a chair. I'm sitting behind the stage kind of watching. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not there yet. But at the same it's time, it. I'm still learning what everyone else is learning. Yeah, you are. And that brings me to the fact that, so you've been teaching as a, a coach in various one-on-one platforms, uh, group coaching. You have a lot of people that you now mentor. Do you have people or anyone specific that you work with as your mentor at this stage? Like mm-hmm. who, who do you reach out to as you are growing? Oh, gosh, that's such a good question and I've been thinking about this. Yes. So over the years there have definitely been people in my media career who I've reached out to. Mm-hmm. So my co-host in Country Victoria Grant was the general manager at the same time. Country radio stations, you do a lot He's of dual a lot of roles. roles. Yeah. Sure. So he definitely is someone that I still call every time something, you know, blows up in my face. I'm like, oh, God, what would you do in this scenario? He has a lot of great insights to share. And now I've been working, oh, I not specifically with anybody. This is probably, it's a little bit yeah, symptomatic actually of maybe I need that at the minute in my yeah. life. I need someone to help me kind of take a, a step back from the whole thing and look at how everything's set up. Mm. I've been swapping services with a lovely lady called Harmony who does uh, a bit of stuff around around feeling good, you know, and and looking at like your mindset and some of that stuff. I've also swapped services and did some work with a girl called Prati who made these beautiful healing teas, which are amazing for all my health issues. So I've been dipping into things, Mm -hmm. but look, to be honest, I'm trying really hard to tap into my own intuition Mm -hmm. and find what I've got inside that's really going to help me. I haven't asked you specifically in this instance about your story with your health struggles, but that's something that you have communicated with your audience and being quite public about yeah. and I think shows a lot of honesty so your, your health struggles have really directed some of the ways of which you're working now yeah definitely you know I, I know that I probably can't work the same way I did when I was full-time in radio and that's because I live with three autoimmune illnesses one is particularly rare and was misdiagnosed for a long time that's known as, it's called Addison's disease which is adrenal insufficiency President Kennedy had Addison's disease. If you're looking for evidence or, you know, similar cases of it around the place, the other person who had it was Helen Reddy, I am woman, 
And it's, but it's about, about two and a half thousand people in Australia are diagnosed with Addison's Super disease. Rare. So wow. pretty rare, which means that when you present with it to hospitals, you kind of need a plan. You need a letter in your hand from your doctor saying, this is the course of treatment this person needs. You can't just go in there and say, hey, my sodium levels are really low. You're going to need to put me on IV sodium. They just won't do that, you know. Um, but Addison's disease is Which I imagine life- takes a bit of a process it, to get oh, to that yeah, point. It you does, know? yeah. You know, it took ages for it to be diagnosed. I, in fact, Googled my symptoms one time, took it to a GP, and he said, oh, it's so rare. There's no way you've got that. And I accepted it because the symptoms included being skinny and brown, and I was, you know, a television and radio presenter, what do you expect me to say? I love being skinny and brown. Let's not mess this up. You know, so it was, um, yeah, it was a while before I was formally diagnosed. By then I was pretty fucked off with medicine. I had been through a journey and a half. I missed out on the chance to become a mother, biological mother, because this of, because of this misdiagnosis. Mm. I was trying all of these things to get pregnant, we discovered that I probably went through menopause, I don't know, at 19, 20 years old, and that was missed as well. So there was a lot of things that pointed to me just going, you know what, I'm not listening to any of you guys. And I made a huge mistake and stopped taking any of the medications that I needed to be on and woke up one day in the Royal Perth ICU with the nurse holding my hand who explained to me uh, that I was there and pulled a feeding tube out of my throat and thought I'd been in a car accident. And she explained, no, I'd had two seizures, that I'd bitten my tongue, uh, that my throat would hurt because we'd been feeding you with a tube for about a week. So, yeah, it was a really big stuff up Mm. (laughs) in the most insane ways. It stemmed from so many different things. The reason I give you that whole background is that now to avoid that happening again, I need to manage medications, Mm -hmm. my stress levels, my lifestyle in such a way that I've had to learn how to do that. So being a casual employee, doing the casual radio that I was doing for a while when I first met you, that really helped. It gave me a chance to build up something that's of my own, my own Mm -hmm. product. And now it's all me on my own product um, I, like I said, I, I, I know I will still do something in the media. I, yep. I'm never going to lose that love. That's a really big part of who I am and what I do. I'm, I'm pivoting again post COVID. I'm really leaning back towards supporting people with their media and going more into a consultancy and helping those clients. But I do it all because I can have that flexible lifestyle. Mm. The other thing is, I'm a very big fan of sticking the caravan on the back of the car. And going around regional WA and going an amazing, you know, hiking trip across the the Gibb River Road like we did a couple of years well, ago. Well, this, this version of Carmen, yeah. of all the different Carmen hats, <laughs> the Outback Carmen, yeah. um, <laughs> the Adve- Outback WA Carmen, mm. so you host se- segments on that. Yeah. Even if you didn't, you you tend to host your own segments through social media, sharing your stories. True. I love it because uh, you're really, you may not be an official, you're definitely an unofficial ambassador of yeah. WA um, and you're just so passionate. Passionate. You're born and bred West Australian. Yep. Um, you're born in uh, Kalamunda. Kalamunda, just up the road from Mum and Dad's house, where you DJed my 40th birthday for hours and hours and hours on end. It was, it was so amazing. much fun. It really was. <laughs> you come from a great party household that knows how to have a good time. We do. But those family roots, you all love to to camp. You all camp yeah. in style. I've seen your camper trailer. It's <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty good. It is well glamping. Yeah. Mum and Dad's is the one to aspire to. That yeah. thing is outrageous, and I like to just go and hang out. Bigger than my apartment. Oh, it might be. You could podcast inside Mum and Dad's caravan. It's actually sure. a really good idea. It's worth. We could do that on the road sometime. <laughs> you know, and I love that flexibility of the lifestyle you can have here. You know, we used to have a boat. I used to work from the back of the boat, and I hope that we do that again yeah. sometime. All the different skills that you can use. Um, uh, the future is definitely. Whilst you do have a lot of choice, lifestyle does seem to be an important factor for you in deciding how you actually want to, you know, move forward. Yeah. Look, I used to feel quite trapped by a full-time job. Mm. I still have this incredible desire, an almost defiant desire to be independent. Yes. I am married to a guy who's got, you know, enough income to support us both if I decided to, you know, do that or if I'd been able to have Mm. kids, then maybe I would be. But I I don't think I would have been able to just sit there and not work. I just know that I'm that person Mm. and that's there's nothing wrong with one or the other. I I recall even in a full-time job though, 
as much as I love my work, feeling often kind of trapped by it. I just love flexibility. I love mm. being able to go, this sounds great. Yes. Let's go do that. Like, you know, I know that in April next year I'll be part of the Shore Leave Festival for Geraldton, which people don't think of as a place to go on a holiday, but you've got the most incredible chain, an archipelago, that's the one, of islands, the Abrolhos Islands that that, that festival celebrates, right? So... For me, emceeing a long table lunch on a remote island off of Geraldton, Western Australia is pretty freaking exciting and I want to be able to say yes to that gig. Absolutely. So that's what that flexibility of the business gives me and, yeah, I'm not ready to give that up yet. Absolutely. Well, that's really living the dream in my eyes. But what my personal goals are tied into travel and work and yeah. having work that allows me to travel. Yeah. So I feel like with you that's also part of it. You do love travelling and now you're getting to to go and host that, but you still get to have those experiences. But then being the sort of performer that you are, mm. I can't imagine you not wanting to get up there and, and host and share your love of, of WA and, and those experiences with people. Subsequently, be able to record that and share that either just on your own socials or for various platforms. Yeah, whoever will have me. If, yes. they, if they want to hear the stories, I'll share them totally. But, you know, this is what I'm always yeah. saying to my clients. You don't need that. You yeah. just put it out through your own and exactly. it's there. This is a, so this question I have I've asked uh, all of the, the people on my podcast so far it's such a difficult question because it's like how long's a piece of string but the, the question is uh, what is your greatest professional achievement to date and it doesn't have to be the greatest but what is something that really stands out in your mind that you're most proud of there there are some pretty cool things you know the the good thing about radio is it's given me a chance to see most of Australia while I was working yeah. TV has given me the chance to do awesome things, like great experiences that a lot of other people wouldn't even get a chance to access, you know, like simply dragging up crayfish off of the side of Rotnest and cooking them on the side of a boat or flying over the bungles uh, in remote Western Australia. You know, we didn't discover the bungles until like 20 years ago when some helicopters doing a mining that. survey went, what are those? You know, there's so many cool things mm -hmm. about our own state that that I've been able to experience. I got to travel to the United States for the radio awards when I was 24 years old. Like that yeah. to me, was that was a scholarship that I won through creating some really innovative um, technology to help broadcast local content to remote audiences in country Victoria. Oh, sensational. Yeah, you know, like that was pretty cool. That I'm is really unreal. proud of that. We, were, we, were, we won an innovative award and we were innovative. You know, we, we really did live up to that. And it wasn't, we weren't the best of the regional radio stations. Mm -hmm. We weren't the best of the little guys. We were the best of Australia. That was how we won that prize. So I'm really proud of that. That is, uh, yeah. that is something absolutely to be proud of. Isn't it interesting, though, of, of you know, the last three years knowing each other because our anniversary is coming up <laughs> and all the stories that I get to ask you each time and then even yeah. just being in the media, there's things that we, when you're out there in the open and sort of people see a version of your life and you're yeah. seeing you're out at events, but you sort of insert yourself in knowing that that's what you're doing and that's what mm. you're going. I love hearing those stories of like before you were sort of known. I think that's just so interesting yeah. of what set you up and what's not out there. I that's what's cool about podcasts. Isn't, isn't it? Because yeah. it's just kind of drawing on those the, the history of those things and yeah, so, so stories of what make you, the fabric of make, what makes you who you are. Oh, I like that Yeah. Too. One of my questions was, do you have any tips for people wanting to get started in the industry? And for this one, it's got the events industry, but I do think specifically more media because mm. given that's your background, yeah. other than run away. <laughs> no, no, I, I think we I need know people. It. We need fresh faces in the broadcast media. Uh, when my friends call me up and say, hey, my kid wants to do radio. So I'm people like, come up and ask you. And oh, it, yeah, yeah, it does still happen. Yeah. And it, when it does happen, I'm delighted because I think, oh, kids, when they could do media at school, they're probably not thinking radio and TV. They're thinking digital media, like they want to be a YouTube star. They really are. Yeah. Uh, so when I meet a kid, I go, what do you mean by media? What's what's your interest? Right, and they of course. Will, you have to clarify what, yeah, is, what is media to them. Definitely. That's the new conversation. But, yeah, every now and then I do meet a kid who says, yeah, I want to be a sports broadcaster. I want to, you know, call and do commentary on footy games. I go, great, okay. So for those kids who are interested in broadcasting, the key tip is get experience as soon as you can. Mm. 
you need to start feeling how it feels when a microphone's in your face or if you're interested in TV, find out how it feels when a camera's in your face Mm -hmm. and start saying things that make as much sense as possible because there will come a time when you'll be out of your comfort zone and you need a muscle memory to fall back on. Yep. So things in broadcasting move really fast and you need to be the one who can go, yeah, I can I can have a crack at that and, and that's how you'll move forward. Yeah. And I was kind of lucky that I had a performance background to fall back on so I was used to feeling nervous and could just get out there but it was totally new speaking and finding my real voice. Mm. And there, were, there was this weird kind of conversion point. I'd get on air and I'd just sound like someone totally different, you know, I'm trying to be <laughs> oh, like. Oh, I heard that as well. Oh, my voice was speaking God. voice where you go, I don't <laughs> sound like that. That nervous <laughs> speaking voice. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Kicks in. That faux Britishness that just sort of kicks in when I'm nervous <laughs> and wanting to speak properly. <laughs> it's all kinds, aren't they? And that's it. it. It actually is this holy grail mm. to find your authentic speaking voice. So, yeah, the sooner you can start doing that and now we've got so many ways. Mm. You know, the last conversation I had with a, a kid who was interested in radio, I said, yeah, look, why not start a podcast? Anything. Doesn't have to be, doesn't have to be that good. They've all got the same connection to perfection. They're like, oh, I don't want to start. Just start. Just just start. Do your family history. Do I, I had some podcasting students at a private school that I did some work with recently. And he went and did the stories behind all the people who have the markets down at Fremantle. Brilliant. You know, like. I love that. Just just look in your backyard and see where the stories lie. Mm. There'll be someone somewhere. Interview your grandparents. Get those stories on tape. Anything you can do to practice the art of listening to the answer that a a person's giving you and following the conversation. Andrew Denton, one of Australia's best interviewers, he always says the the most important skill an interviewer can have is to listen. Yes. Just ask the question and shut up because people love to fill a silence. They do. Andrew Denton went to my university, by the way. Oh, my gosh. You come from really, really good pedigree. (laughs) But the pedigree coming from your course, one of the things I learned, one of my favourite ones is lose your connection to perfection. Mm. The other one was that just film it. It doesn't have to go anywhere. So before we did any of this, this is season two. We've had season one. There is a lot of filming, a lot of practising. That was a really important step. So I think that's one thing that I would definitely share as a tip, your tip that it doesn't necessarily have to go anywhere or be used mm-hmm. for something specific. Just practice the skill because it does take a lot of time just to be able to understand how far you need to be yeah. from the microphone, being comfortable hearing the sound of your own voice, particularly as I'm starting to MC in large rooms, hearing myself speak on the a echo. microphone <laughs> and my voice being reverberated around the room. Yeah. I'm still going through that process of being like, oh, my God, everyone can hear me and I can hear me and it sounds so weird. So each time, each time you evolve, there's new skills to learn and new ways to freak yourself out. <laughs> there are. And you know, I did all those things out in the country. You know, that used to be what how you built up your skill mm. as a broadcaster. I still recommend going to the country. If you're not getting the job in your home city or hometown, you probably need to look for a regional job. And oh God, I talked to a journalist only yesterday who's you know, in his early 30s and he's taken off to country Victoria to Brilliant. just get his, his on-air miles up mm. because he thinks that might be the way he wants to go and it's never too late to pivot a career and it's change. It's never too late. I just love yeah. that advice. It's always the always the really the reality of what we're doing is yeah. for yourself as well. You, you've had a, a career in, in so many different directions and even now there's so many different ways you mm. could go and it's not too late to even add something else that might just come out of the woodwork and be like, well, there's an opportunity there. I might just take it. I know. I, I still and read the job ads. I'm still occasionally going, oh, you're still how open. That fit? Maybe, maybe. But, you know, admittedly, the job, you know, it'd have to be a casual job. <laughs> I'm scared of a job. Oh, well, thank you so much for joining me today, Carmen. It really has been an absolute honour to have you here. I was quite nervous asking you here, but you've done everything to make me feel comfortable. I hope you feel quite comfortable here today because it's just been such a joy. It's always so easy to hang out and chat with you. It was amazing. And your rosé is very good too. I mean, champagne. It's rosé all day. Rosé all day. Whatever works for the guest (laughs) is what it is. That brings us to the end of today's episode of Champagne Chats. Thank you so much for joining. If you have enjoyed listening, please make sure to subscribe on your preferred podcast platform or subscribe and do all the things on YouTube. You don't have to. This is not about that. This is all about an opportunity just to kind of share stories and experiences with my cool buddies in the events industry. And remember, may the only pain in your life be champagne. Cheers, dolls. (laughs) 